Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Grit City Think and Drink. I'm your host, Jim Gal. Uh, I am a professor at the Uni University of Washington Tacoma in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. So glad to virtually see all of you tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker, and then she's going to give you an amazing talk. And then afterwards, we will give away some swag. So hold on for um, the giveaway at the end and to answer questions or ask questions of our speaker afterwards. So without further ado, uh, our speaker, Anna Grote Carmona, uh, Dr. Anna Grote Carmona, is a first generation Latin American scientist who studies the molecular determinants of disease causing microbes. While she originally hails from the East Coast, Brookfield, Connecticut, uh, nobody should actually like fess up that they're from Brookfield, Connecticut, but we'll go with that. Uh, she received her BA in biology from Reed College in Portland and her PhD in infectious disease and immunity from UC Berkeley, uh, which is not a slouchy institution. Uh, after competing, uh, completing two postdoctoral positions at the UW and the Center for Infectious Disease Research in Seattle, she is now an assistant professor in the Sciences and Mathematics Division at UW Tacoma. Her research centers on improving our understanding of the morphological changes that govern liver stage development of malaria, which is a critical bottleneck point in the parasitic life cycle and a key step towards developing novel medical countermeasures. So without further ado, our speaker, Dr. Grote Carmona. Hi everyone. All right, thank you so much for uh, having me here. It's a great privilege to, uh, privilege to be able to come and uh, talk at the Grit City Think and Drink. So uh, obviously I'm not talking to you today about my particular research, although I'd love to come back and actually discuss what I do in the lab with the students that I'm uh, monitoring in uh, UW Tacoma. But uh, for this talk, I actually wanted to take a moment to compare this very historic moment that we are all experiencing, this uh, pandemic uh, caused by a disease that we know as COVID-19. But I wanted to contrast our current pandemic with a, another pandemic that took place a little over 100 years ago, and that is the 1918 flu pandemic. And a reason for why I wanted to compare these particular pandemics um, side by side is that while they are different, there are quite a few similarities with what's going on um, and some of the you know, external convergence factors that have given rise to what we are experiencing now um, that are very similar to what was happening in the 1918. So to kind of give you guys an idea of uh, some of these similarities, I actually found uh, newspaper clippings with uh, very similar headlines from the Seattle Times. Uh, and so despite the fact that these two articles from the Seattle Times uh, were released, uh, you know, a little over 100 years apart from one another, uh, they both show very similar headlines. And indeed, it can almost be like these uh, were released at the same time. And so really what this boils down to is that these two pandemics had a, a widespread effect on the world. And indeed, when it comes to uh, having a huge impact on world mortality and kind of uh, world dynamics, uh, the 1918 flu pandemic was a big one. Um, so just to kind of give everyone an overview here, for the 1918 flu pandemic, uh, even though we use that uh, year, 1918, it actually did take uh, place over the course of a little over two years. So all in all, it went from uh, as early as February 1918 uh, down to uh, the early parts of spring of 1920. Oh. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, toll, sorry, that's my kid. Uh, in terms of death toll, uh, worldwide incidence of disease, the 1918 flu pandemic uh, infected nearly a third of the world's population at that time, so roughly accounting for 500 million infections worldwide. Uh, from those infections, the estimates of the death toll is actually somewhat disputed. There are anywhere from uh, accounts of 18 million people having died in that pandemic, and those estimates can range anywhere from 18 million to 100 million people having lost their lives during that two-year um, time frame. Now, 
just to kind of give you a reference uh, uh, for what that number might actually mean for the world population at that time, um, at that moment in 1918, the population of the United States, so the entirety of the United States, was actually roughly 105 million people. So in the span of two years, we lost almost our entire population of our country in that frame, right? You can almost look at it that way. Now that's not what happened, right? These are the worldwide numbers. Um, with respect to what happened within the United States, it's a lot smaller, but just to kind of give you an idea of what a hundred million people looks like at that time, it was roughly the population of our country at that moment. Now within our population, within the United States, uh, we have, it's estimated that roughly 25% of the population was infected and that accounts for roughly 675,000 deaths. Okay. Uh, now with respect to our current pandemic, now these numbers are actually growing. So as of this morning, uh, these are the, uh, accounts for what's going on with the current pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic that we are currently experiencing. Uh, so this started, uh, was declared a pandemic in March of 2020. It is still ongoing. Uh, but so far worldwide, we've had uh, roughly 27.2 million infections and upwards of 891,000 deaths. Now, in terms of what's happening within the United States during this time, uh, we've had roughly 6.2 million infections and you know, just under 190,000 deaths. So let's take a look at these pandemics side by side. And I actually picked uh, this image for this talk. It's kind of representative for this talk. Uh, it, it kind of just happened while I was looking up for pictures. I found a picture uh, from the 1918 flu pandemic and I had literally just gone and searched and found images of people and decorative masks from our current pandemic. And indeed, uh, that same kind of idea of a fashion trend, turning face masks into a fashion trend in order to survive actually did happen in 1918. And you can see here that people did actually try to dress up their face masks um, in such a way that, you know, made it fashionable, something that they could wear out in public. So I thought that these two images, you know, again, 102 years apart and yet remarkably similar. And that is uh, the case for these pandemics. There are a lot of similarities between what happened 102 years ago versus what's happening now. But first things first, let's kind of compare them and, and get at the nitty gritty of what's going on here. So in terms of what caused these pandemics, uh, the causative agents are both viruses and they are both RNA viruses, but they are different RNA viruses. So with the case of the 1918 flu pandemic, this was obviously caused by the uh, virus we know as influenza, uh, whereas the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 is caused by a coronavirus and a new strain of coronavirus that we have not yet uh, seen before called severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus or SARS-CoV and yes, uh, the number two. So SARS-CoV-2 being the causative agent for COVID-19 and influenza having caused this pandemic back in 1918. So two different viruses, all right? And in terms of disease severity, uh, two very different disease phenotypes. Now I'm not gonna go through the whole laundry list of symptoms that you see here, but I do hope you guys see that uh, some of them are familiar, right? Flu-like symptoms. I think we're all very familiar with flu-like symptoms. And indeed, both of these viruses appeared to cause that uh, condition. But you'll notice here in the middle, there is a laundry list of kind of non-specific and ambiguous symptoms. And I say non-specific in that these are not characteristic of either flu or coronavirus. They could be characteristic of any number of diseases. Um, but we do see in, in both of these pandemics that patients didn't just come down with what you would typically expect for these viruses. They actually came down with a laundry list of different other symptoms. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot more to it than just getting the flu, all right? Uh, with influenza, there was insomnia, hair loss, teeth loss, spontaneous bleeding from the mouth and nose, all right? And a lot of that had to do with some of the more complications that come with uh, that particular virus. 
um, particularly the uh, kind of overstimulation of your immune system, um, what we call a cytokine storm. So cytokines are proteins involved in immune signaling. Uh, so they're immune proteins. Uh, they help with uh, modulating inflammatory responses. And in the short term, that is a very good thing for combating disease. In the short term, inflammation is very helpful for your immune system to coordinate the effects. But in the long term, that can cause some serious problems. And indeed, if you overstimulate cytokine production, you can cause serious complications in a clinical setting. Um, and so one of the more prominent features that you saw with uh, influenza in terms of complications, uh, obviously the possibility for pneumonia was there, but also some pretty uh, nasty conditions where uh, your skin turned gr uh, blue and you ultimately died of uh, hypoxia, uh, or you also had hemorrhaging from mucous membranes. So some pretty severe effects here with, associated with this virus. Um, and the same goes for SARS-CoV-2. There are some serious complications here. And initially we thought that some of these complicating uh, conditions, uh, you know, some of the more severe effects of this virus uh, were related to a similar effect, meaning that they, the virus essentially caused that cytokine storm that we saw with flu. But we've since gotten some new evidence that suggests that maybe it isn't actually a cytokine storm. It might be a different immune mo uh, molecule uh, and that might be causing that illness. So hopefully we get more information about that particular condition as we go along here. Uh, but definitely there are complications, uh, pneumonia being one of them. Now, interestingly enough, this laundry list of symptoms that I've given you here uh, are actually unusual <laughs> for these particular viruses, all right? If you think about seasonal flu, we don't really worry about losing your hair, right? Um, if you think about coronavirus, which normally is associated with colds. In fact, 15% of all colds during cold season are actually caused by coronaviruses, uh, the vast majority of which are actually caused by rhinoviruses. Uh, and then there's a couple other viruses that also cause those same cold symptoms. But this is definitely not a cold right here on the right, okay? So how did we get from what would be a normal uh, disease associated with these kind of seasonal viruses of coronavirus and seasonal flu, right, seasonal influenza, how do you go from something that is far less uh, kind of scary looking and then something that has more uh, kind of, you know, oddball symptoms that you wouldn't necessarily associate with it? So how did that happen, right? How do you go from a normal uh, circulating strain to something that has the potential to cause a more severe disease and the potential for a pandemic? And so the disease severity here has a lot to do with the virus uh, as much as it does with the environmental conditions that gave rise to these pandemics. So we're not going to go into too much of the molecular nitty gritty here, okay? Uh, so they are virus cap uh, viruses. Uh, viruses have very simplistic structure. They do have a genome, right? Both of these viruses happen to have RNA genomes. Uh, these particular RNA genomes are what we call single-stranded RNA genomes. So they're not a duplex of two strands, they're a single-stranded molecule. Um, and we characterize single-stranded uh, RNA genomes depending on how they are treated when the genome is inserted into a host cell. So if I was an influenza virus, um, I would have my RNA genome. That RNA genome is segmented. It actually comes in eight different segments, and we'll get more onto that later. Uh, those eight segments are covered by a, a protein capsid structure that is then encased in a lipid envelope that has two proteins on it, all right, two viral proteins on it, among the others. The two main proteins I want to point out here, though, are the ones that I mentioned earlier with respect to naming these viruses. Uh, the two proteins that you find on the outer capsid of, of influenza are going to be hemagglutinin and neuromides, and these are the two proteins that are characterized when we name these viruses. So if you have a particular type of, of hemagglutinin protein, you get a number designation. Um, if you have a particular type of neuromides protein, you get a number designation, and then your virus is named accordingly. So H1N1, H5N1, right? You can mix and match those proteins and you can get a variety of different viruses. Uh, but you can also mix and match those eight segmented <laughs> genomes um, and that also can create problems with respect to new kind of pandemic strains. 
So this is a, 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 a what we call minus strand RNA virus. It means that the RNA has to have an intermediate step before it can be uh, translated into the 10 viral proteins that this virus is going to need to replicate inside of host cells. Uh, but compare that to say a coronavirus. Coronavirus um, actually also has a single stranded genome, but its genome can be immediately translated once it's introduced into the cell side of uh, the cell, the infected cell. So once that RNA genome, right, once this virus infects that cell and inserts its genome, this particular RNA genome, which isn't segmented, uh, can be immediately translated into protein and it translates approximately 19, uh, 29 of them. So this is a relatively large genome for a virus, right? So these two viruses, uh, in addition to both being RNA viruses, and it is worth noting that RNA viruses are more highly uh, mutable than their DNA viral counterparts, right? RNA viruses have higher mutation rates in general. Uh, but these two viruses, in addition to being mutable RNA viruses, they also have uh, what we call a zoonotic uh, phenotype. They are zoonotic diseases, all right? And these are pathogens that essentially have the ability to jump from an um, animal reservoir, so a non-human animal reservoir, typically a vertebrate, and they can jump from that vertebrate host to a human host and cause disease. So zoonotic, animal, uh, zoonotic diseases like influenza and coronavirus have their animal reservoir where they circulate. They also have their human reservoir where they circulate. And for the most part, things stay as are. Uh, it's really when humans start encroaching in areas where these uh, viruses and these organisms don't normally kind of meet, right? When, when essentially when worlds collide here, uh, you have always the potential that some of these circulating animal viruses, maybe one has the ability to not just infect that animal, but also infect a human. In other words, a spillover event. A human comes into contact with these animal reservoirs and a virus that happens to be able to infect that human cell has enough differences from the, uh, the animal circulating viruses to be able to infect a human host that it can spill over to that human host and cause disease. Now, uh, spillover events tend to have high mortality rates, high case fatality rates. Um, and that was certainly something that we saw uh, with a different coronavirus uh, back in the early parts of 2012. Uh, that virus was called Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or MERS-CoV. Uh, MERS-CoV uh, had a high fatality rate, but it was very, very hard to transmit, all right? So that spillover event did happen, but we didn't really see human-to-human -human transmission, all right? There wasn't a sustained uh, transmission in the population, so it was a very short-lived outbreak. However, if a spillover event does result in sustained human transmission where that virus is now circulating within that human population independent of that original animal reservoir, well now you have the potential for pandemic strains and certainly not just SARS-CoV-2 but also SARS-CoV-1 back in early 2000s also had this potential. Now SARS-CoV-1 had a higher fatality rate than what we see with COVID-19 but SARS-CoV-2, or, or sorry, uh, SARS-CoV, right, the one that caused the, pen, uh, the epidemic back in the early 2000s, uh, this one wasn't as easy to transmit as SARS-CoV-2, right? So the one we're currently dealing with is far more transmissible, even though it has a lower fatality rate. Now, in terms of uh, influenza, please do not be discouraged. Influenza follows a very similar pattern. It's the same idea. They have the uh, animal reservoir and those viruses can spill over into a human population. Um, and that hasn't just happened for the 1918 flu pandemic. It also happened for a handful of other flu pandemics that have occurred since 1918. Uh, it also applies to other viruses like smallpox or HIV or even more recently Ebola. All right. So not just these two viruses. There are a lot of other viruses that are zoonotic. Um, as well as other bacteria and, uh, that are capable of doing this kind of spillover event. Now, in terms of identifying the animal reservoir for these two viruses that we're talking about, that's a little bit harder to do. So for SARS-CoV-2, we have a pretty good idea that it likely came from a bat, 
Uh, the sequence of this virus very much closely matches bats, about 96% sequence homology, so very likely bat origins. Uh, but in terms of the H1N1 influenza virus that caused that 1918 pandemic, eh, not so much. We don't really know what the cause of that uh, pandemic was. Likely it was an avian source, but it's hard to say for sure, all right? Uh, so in terms of what caused that particular pandemic, we're not really uh, clear on that. Hopefully we can get more information as time goes on, but we're still kind of learning as we go along. Now SARS-CoV-2, right, likely bat origin, right, so likely a bat reservoir that spilled over somehow. Uh, but that virus actually, we do know, originated in Wuhan, China. It's actually where the uh, virus was first identified. It's where we first started hearing about these cases. And slowly but surely, this virus spread and kind of went everywhere and thus kind of ended up being a pandemic in March of this year. Uh, but it's originally from Wuhan, China. Now, I would love to be able to point to a map here and show you exactly where the H1N1 influenza virus came from, right? We don't know the reservoir, but I would love to tell you where it actually originated from. Uh, but the truth is we don't know. The origins for this particular strain of influenza is hotly debated, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna give you kind of what's the consensus for what started this pandemic. And then I'm gonna tell you about some other lines of inquiry that are currently uh, being discussed and, and, and uh, debated. So for one thing, let's get it out of the way. Uh, this pandemic is also referred to as the Spanish flu. And so if you have a, turn, a name like that, the Spanish flu, one might imagine that it originated in Spain. And no, it did not. <laughs> that is actually entirely not the case. Uh, the Spanish flu did not originate in Spain. Uh, the reason why it got the moniker of Spanish flu is because of something else that was going on during 1918. Uh, so for those of you who are aware, uh, on 19, uh, during the 1918 flu pandemic, we were still in the middle of World War I. And during World War I, the Allied troops, including the United States, did not want to have their enemies be aware of their troop loss or how many casualties they had had or what the status of their economy was back home, right? This was information that was being heavily guarded. And so a lot of newspapers were censored within this, uh, you know, within the allied countries because they didn't want that information to get to their enemies. Spain during the World War I was neutral and thus had no censorship issues and therefore was free to actually report about what was going on in this pandemic. Because Spain was so adamant and very open and very uh, vigorous about reporting on this pandemic and getting people's attention, uh, most people assumed that it was coming from Spain, and so it got the moniker of Spanish flu. Uh, but that is actually not the only name that it had. Believe it or not, there were a few different names for this pandemic at the time, depending on where you were. Uh, the one that I thought was kind of interesting in Spain, oddly enough, uh, this pandemic was referred to, uh, the virus, uh, sorry, not the virus, uh, they didn't know it was a virus at the time, but the disease was actually referred to as the Naples uh, Soldier. And the reason for this name, it was the name of a musical number in a very popular operetta at the time. And the reason why they named it this is because they said the flu, you know, the song was as catchy as the flu end quote. So <laughs> that got the moniker uh, the Naples soldier in Spain. So there were a few different names going on at that time. Spanish flu is the one that kind of uh, stayed with us over the years. Now for all intents and purposes most uh, people agree that the first reported cases of the 1918 flu pandemic were in Kansas of all places, right? <laughs> Kansas, the United States. We might be the source for this pandemic, guys. Um, it is possible. So that is the most widely accepted start for when uh, flu symptoms associated with the 1918 flu pandemic first occurred. Uh, but I do want to let you know that there, there are some reports of a flu-like disease. They didn't call it flu, uh, but it had similar symptoms to what they saw with the first wave of influenza that hit in February of 1918, right, the early uh, parts of spring in 1918. 
Uh, but this actually occurred, this outbreak occurred a year before, it actually occurred in 1917 uh, in northern France. Uh, another outbreak of a similar kind of flu-like uh, uh, illness also came out in uh, 1917. It was later in 1917, and this one was actually in Sanxi, China. Uh, but in terms of whether these particular outbreaks of flu-like illness were actually caused by flu, that's still up for debate. There's a couple groups working on trying to sequence uh, tis um, uh, tissues, trying to get viral sequence from tissues from uh, autopsy samples of people who died during these particular uh, outbreaks, uh, but currently we don't have a lot of information about what relation they have to what happened in 1918. So these guys are kind of up for debate, but it is kind of interesting uh, to note that a flu-like illness did kind of circulate the year before and that it did actually hit China because at early parts of the 1918 flu pandemic, China didn't seem to be as heavily hit as other countries. And one idea is that maybe having had a small minor outbreak the year before might have conferred some protection in those early stages of the 1918 flu pandemic. But it's hard to say for sure because we don't know exactly whether or not these particular um, epidemics were caused by um, influenza. So uh, how are these guys uh, transmitted? Well, both coronavirus and influenza, they are airborne viruses. So they are in, uh, you do get them through the inhal inhalation of aerosols, either from coughing or sneezing. You can also get it from direct transmission of contaminated surfaces where you touch a surface where a, uh, an aerosol might have dropped and before the virus has desiccated, you uh, touched your face, your eyes, your mouth and got in contact with the virus that way. Now, in terms of measuring how easy it is to transmit these viruses, we uh, use what's called the reproductive potential. Um, and it's a calculation uh, that tells you the expected number of cases uh, when an infected individual walks into an, um, a susceptible population. So if I have one person who is infected and they come into contact with people who have not uh, have immune status for that particular disease, uh, how many of those people are more likely to come down with that disorder because there was an infected individual around? And if you compare not just the COVID-19 pandemic, but also some of the other coronaviruses that have been circulating, and you compare that to flu, uh, well, for, you know, MERS has kind of got a wider range. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic also seems to have a pretty wide range, uh, but it's pretty comparable uh, to what we were seeing in flu. Uh, but this R not value, right? This this value of how how easy it is to catch this disease, how easy it is to transmit this disease. Um, this R not value we're finding actually is really hard to calculate with respect to COVID and the 1918 flu pandemic, and that's because this value actually changed depending on where you were in that pandemic. Because there was such a wide array of responses to that pandemic, certain areas had lower R naught values than others. So really was a regional matter about whether or not you were more likely to come down with this disease uh, based on the number of infected individuals within that population. And so since they're transmitted in similar manners, uh, and, and have relatively same range for transmissibility depending on the region, uh, it may, should come as no surprise that our response to these pandemics were actually quite similar. And indeed, uh, considering what was available at the time, uh, pretty much uh, supportive measures and quote unquote social distancing guidelines was pretty much what people were doing back then to handle the 1918 flu pandemic. Avoid crowds, don't spit on the floor sidewalks, right? Keep those uh, contaminated surfaces clean. Um, they even had uh, um, uh, masks that they were uh, announcements on how to make a mask, instructionals on how to make masks in the newspapers. So similar to what we see in the uh, COVID-19. Now, they didn't call it social distancing. That term did not exist in 1918, all right? So that's something that they were familiar with. Uh, but if you take a look at what they're saying in some of these newspaper clippings, it's pretty much exactly what they were doing. They were essentially encouraging people to, or 
forcing them in some areas to engage in social distancing and to prevent the spread of this disease, all right? So they didn't call it that, but they definitely did do it. And in areas where the disease was kind of, uh, spread was out of control, they did institute quarantines that were mandated by the state. And people did go to jail for failing to cooperate with those mandates. Now, so what's the point of all of these kind of uh, social distancing orders, right? Why are, why are people so harping on all of these kind of healthy hygiene practices and gonna, uh, uh, protection methods? Why are we having this talk virtually as opposed to in an actual bar at the Swiss, right? Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want to flatten the curve. So the idea here is that if you have a pandemic strain or, or any kind of epidemic going on, if you have an outbreak of disease, you do not want to have a high concentration of cases in a very, very short period of time because it'll very, very much easily overwhelm your healthcare system. So by instituting all of these guidelines, right, all of those uh, precautions that they were saying to do at the time, as well as in our current time, what they're really trying to do is they're trying to lower the number of cases that you're going to get and potentially spread them out over a longer period of time. And what that does is it doesn't overwhelm your healthcare system and it ensures that you can actually keep uh, things going in the meantime, right? You can actually keep uh, working, keep, uh, living your life and doing what you need to do, but essentially by instituting these guidelines, you help lower that incidence of disease. Now, in terms of what the flu pandemic looked like, right, what was that incidence of disease? Like I said, this was a two-year pandemic. Uh, most graphs that you look up for, for this uh, spread, they're going to show you uh, three particular peaks. Right? And they're only going to show you the first three waves. And that's because most countries had only the first three waves. There were only a handful of countries that really had the fourth wave of influenza in the early parts of 1920. Now, again, we're in the middle of our, uh, well, actually, I can't even say that. We're in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We are currently in this pandemic. So I can't really tell you how many peaks. Right, I can't even tell you uh, if we're going to be ending this particular peak, right? We're still in this. So it's hard to make a, a determination as to what wave we're in, but we're currently, I'm assuming, still in the first wave. Uh, but we are uh, seeing these kind of drops, at least in deaths. And also, just keep in mind, I'm showing you here the number of deaths per hundred th uh, per thousand people. We're not looking at total number of cases, just the deaths associated um, with these two viruses. And at least for what we're dealing with with COVID-19, since we're in the middle, uh, kind of still in the uh, midst of this pandemic, we really can't say for sure what peaks or what valleys or what did what to whom. So for now, I'm gonna focus mostly on what's going on with the 1918 flu pandemic and kind of looking at those curves, all right? But one thing that does come up whenever you're talking about either of these pandemics, all right? And again, we don't know what's coming up for COVID-19, but one thing that has been uh, shown at least so far with COVID-19 and it has been shown repeatedly with uh, constant looking back at the 1918 flu pandemic and that is that those are not values having you know that that reproducibility being variable depending on where you were at very much had to do with how stringent those social distancing guidelines were in your area so in the 1918 flu pandemic, uh, people who got hit hard in that first wave, uh, a lot of them learned <laughs> right, what to do in anticipation of the next wave. And so when the next wave hit uh, the country, they actually did put in some pretty stringent guidelines. They put in quarantine measures. They made people have uh, instituted curfews. They closed down churches and schools and public gatherings, right? And those cities, at least in the United States and worldwide, that did those kind of stringent guidelines actually not only managed to miss the second wave, but in some cases missed the third wave altogether. So certain cities that were very much on the ball with respect to those social distancing guidelines, uh, again, that's not what they called it at the time, but when they were uh, pretty good about that, you saw that kind of uh, lower, lower incidence of cases. Uh, in areas like, say, San Francisco that didn't uh, 
keep those guidelines going past the second wave, you do see a resurgence of disease in that third wave. So any city where you had a drop or a lapse in those uh, guidelines between the peaks and it wasn't reinstituted, uh, you tended to see more disease in that second and third wave. And in terms of our current pandemic, we're actually seeing something similar. Depending on what state you're in, your curve is going up or going down or staying steady, right? It very much depends on where you're living right now, whether or not you're uh, worried about another wave or if you're kind of hoping for things to kind of die down. So similar to what we saw in 1918 pandemic, there is regional differences, not just in the r not uh, reproducibility, but also in this uh, kind of case fatality, right? What, what, what's, what's going on in each state very much depends on how they're handling it. Um, so I'm not going to get into this right now because we're going to run out of time here pretty soon. So I want to make sure this, but I want to kind of give you guys a shout out over here for a really great resource if you want to waste some time uh, looking up influenza information. Uh, this particular resource uh, actually allows you to go in and look statewide within the United States at various cities. And you can actually look at these newspaper clippings. You can actually read some of the articles that are being written here that were posted at the time. Uh, you can look at timelines for within that city, you know, what things were done when and how that affected the pandemic and the incidence of disease in that area. So if you want to play around with us and check out Seattle, um, I actually have a slide prep for you guys just in case you have any questions about that at the end. So the reason why I'm bringing these guys up is because it's, it's very easy, all right, to simply look at disease as a matter of us versus them, right? Uh, the virus was new. It had a relatively high transmissibility. It triggered some uh, cytokine storms in the host. And our human population was just simply not, never been exposed to it before. And so they were just very much susceptible to this disease. Um, and that would be a very easy way to kind of just look at disease incidents. But the thing is, um, in 1918, no one really knew what flu was, right? The, the concept of a virus wasn't really uh, around at that time. They knew it wasn't necessarily a bacterium. Some people thought it was a Haemophilus influenza, which is a bacterium. Uh, some people didn't know what it was. They just, you know, there's some indication that we might've had some inklings that there were viruses, but we just didn't know what they were. It was just something that wasn't bacterial. And that was about as much as we knew back then. Uh, viruses don't actually get identified until the 30s. Kind of on that note, um, we didn't have a vaccine for flu either at that time. Uh, we don't get the flu vaccine until uh, the late 30s, early 40s, uh, or early mid 40s. Uh, we also don't have antiviral, you know, antiviral therapies, right? Because we don't even know what it is. Uh, we also didn't have antibiotics. Uh, penicillin doesn't get discovered until 1928. So while antibiotics don't treat viral infections, uh, they would have been helpful to combat those bacterial pneumonia that were associated with both of the, uh, with the 1918 flu. Um, and certainly because they didn't have very much to go on there, right? There's no vaccine, no, they don't really know what it is. Uh, they don't have anything to combat it. So really when it came to treating influenza, uh, well, take a look at some of these uh, uh, regimens. I'm, I'm not entirely sure quinine and arsenic would be my go-to. And certainly aspirin sounds innocuous, but for the levels that they were prescribing at that time, it was actually pretty toxic. Uh, in addition to kind of some of these remedies that people were just trying to throw out there to, to, to you know, do something to try to fight this disease, uh, snake oil salesmen also kind of came up here. And, and actually there were a few that even tried to stale literally snake oil as a possible treatment for influenza um, or even kind of tonics or regimens or, you know, eat more onions, right? So misinformation was a serious problem at this point, uh, not just for us, but also for the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, and so really, because there were no real treatments, we didn't really have a drug or a vaccine to help us with it, uh, governments relied on isolation, disinfection, and essentially personal protection equipment, right? That was essentially what they had to rely on to uh, contain this pandemic. So. I'm gonna skip ahead here, all right, um, to kind of look at more globally, just say that, that there's more to disease than just us versus them. So I'll kind of leave it off here so that in case people have more questions, I can actually go through a little bit more on the specifics for what happened in 1918. Um, 
But in general, we, we really need to start looking at disease a little differently. We really need to start thinking about this, not just from the perspective of us versus them, but kind of what our role in disease actually is, all right? Because our role in this particular pandemic actually was quite severe. So I'm going to skip through this part real quick. Um, but just to kind of give you guys an idea, if you were to take a look at the 1918 flu pandemic and examine it from kind of a more wider lens, us versus them is not enough. You really need to take into account World War I and the troop movements associated with World War I and how that influenced each of these four peaks. You really need to look at the social uh, aspects of what happened during this time, right? The uh, transportation, right? Uh, the misinformation con uh, that was going on at that time. Uh, the massive loss of life. Don't forget, 100 million people died during this pandemic, all right? So this is a massive amount of loss, that you, uh, loss of life that you're having at this time. That's going to affect your economy. Um, that's also going to affect uh, your biology, right? The war would have had effects on whether you were nourished or, or if you had good hygiene practices. Uh, physically being in trench warfare has some pretty uh, stringent uh, uh, physical constraints that can also contribute to the, the rise of disease. And essentially for the 1918 flu pandemic, all of these factors in addition to that virus and those changes all contribute to give us um, what we saw with this pandemic. So to give you guys an idea here again, that those, those government interventions were key, key to being able to uh, bring down this pandemic and get it under control. And those areas, those cities that did uh, institute those stringent guidelines and those stringent quarantines uh, did manage to uh, do better and fare better um, than those states and cities that didn't. So one, le uh, one last thing to kind of leave you off here 1918 flu pandemic is a bad one. Yes, definitely. It is not the only flu pandemic we have had, and there have been a number. Now, I've included avian flu here, not because it was a pandemic. It, it actually isn't. It's an outbreak. It, it didn't have that widespread global. Um, but in terms of trans, uh, infectivity and virulence, this was a very different influenza uh, strain compared to swine flu or even some of the ones that came before in the 60s and 50s. And compare that to SARS-CoV-2. Well, SARS-CoV-1 didn't really have a high death count. MERS didn't really have a high death count. But somewhere between SARS-CoV-1 MERS and SARS-CoV-2, something's happening. And again, we're in the middle of this pandemic, so it's hard to say what that is, but we're definitely seeing a shift here in coronaviruses. And this is something we might want to pay more attention to, because if we've learned anything from flu, one pandemic doesn't mean the end of that story. It can continue. And indeed, flu has continued to cause massive pandemics over and over again over the course of this time. Um, and it's potential that coronaviruses will as well. So with that, uh, I'll leave it here. And uh, sorry I went over time, but thank you guys so much for, for letting me speak here. And if we have time, I'll, I'll answer whatever questions you guys got for me. Awesome. Uh, well, let's hear a virtual uh, uh, shout out for our, our speaker today. Thank you, Anna. That was awesome. Uh, so, uh, we're going to do a couple things. One, uh, if you, we're going to give away some socks. So, um, some Think and Drink sh swag, we will get it to you. Uh, so, the way this works, um, I will give you the, um, so I want you to pick a number between 1 and 20 and chat it to me. So, the first two people um, that are not named Meg Henderson will actually win a pair of socks because Meg has been the luckiest person in the world. Uh, but I believe she's now outfitted her entire family with socks. So um, everyone else, we're going to um, let Meg take a breather on this one. So pick your, pick your numbers. And the first two people that get it correct, we will have our winner. So I see some numbers coming in. It looks like... 
uh, our winners, because the number was 18 uh, for the 1918 uh, flu. Uh, so Scott Redmond and uh, Carolyn Blas Blasdell, um, both of you win. So what you can do, since this will only go to me, if you want to text me your mailing address, I will send you a pair of socks. Also, let me know whether you want larger or smaller. Um, those are basically the two sizes I have. So it's kind of small, medium, or medium large. So send me those and I will get them to you. And thank you all. Um, uh, too bad we gave away uh, the SWIFT certificate, but hopefully we'll be Sometime next year, I'm guessing from what I've heard about the pandemic, we'll hopefully be able to do this in person again. We'll see. Um, but so uh, for everyone, if you uh, want have a question for our speaker, please uh, send your chat your question here and we will ask our lovely speaker uh, what she has for us. Um, uh, I'm going to start it off just so we, while we're waiting for other questions, Anna. Doctor, sorry, Dr. Grote Carmona. Uh, so I have heard that the, it seems recently looking at the, the, as somebody mentioned and I posted it up there, Marianne mentioned that the Pierce County Health Department has um, um, some really cool um, data that they've been accumulating. It seems like we're getting lots of cases and fewer like illnesses or, or you know, to hospitalizations, I guess I would say. Is there something going on with the way that this is that COVID-19 is working that's kind of changing things now? So uh, it, it's hard to say because again uh, the 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 tricky part is that we're we're still we're still in it right we're still we're still dealing with things we're still having to to, to accumulate the data but it is it is interesting that that we're seeing kind of a drop in the the hospitalizations that could be a number of different factors. It could be the virus, right? It, it's possible that the virus just got less virulent as time went on. Um, that is something that was actually suggested for why the third and fourth waves of the 1918 flu pandemic were actually less than the second. It was potentially that the second wave gave everyone some kind of immunity or you know, some kind of form of herd immunity that protected them or potentially that the virus you know, became less virulent and therefore you had less disease. So that is definitely a possibility. Uh, the other possibility is also kind of external factors. So kind of like um, our intervention strategies might be a little bit more on point. We might have better, you know, faster test results so that we can give you a uh, treatment sooner or we can get you supportive treatment sooner. Um, so there, there's also some of those factors that aren't necessarily the virus, but more our behaviors that can also kind of limit um, that severity and change uh, that it, um, change those incidence curves. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Cindy. She asks, uh, "Do we know how long SARS-CoV-2 stays alive on different surfaces?" So, so there there are a couple studies that we're looking into this uh, and and figuring out what it is. I. I think it's a few hours if I remember this correctly, but I haven't checked the latest of the ones that came out. This is again, stuff that always gets updated, but I believe that they have actually some information about how long on surfaces. It also depends on the surface is the other thing. So we know certain surfaces, viruses can stay there uh, in a moist kind of aerosol droplet, right? They can, they can stay in that fomite for, for quite some time um, and stay hydrated, if you will, for, for that period of time. Uh, but if it's a porous surface or something that absorbs liquid quite well, you, you won't have the virus be able to survive for as long. So the surface type definitely matters, right? Definitely matters. Um, but uh, we are definitely, uh, sorry, surface type definitely matters. Uh, and also the length of time um, are you worried about like say a package or, or just in general or like cleaning mechanism, Cindy? <laughs> she can't speak at the moment. Oh, sorry. Let's see. I can unmute Cindy. Uh, I think. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think I was just um, interested generally. I mean, I remember early on 
um, seeing a study that talked about how long the virus stays alive on cardboard versus stainless steel versus plastic. And I do recall that it was, you know, different times. But since then, there's been a lot of talk or conversation about um, the chance of catching the virus through contaminated surfaces is actually less than we maybe initially thought. And so I guess I'm just, I'm just trying to gauge how, uh, you know, how worried I need to be about contaminated surfaces in general. So for, so for, so in general, right, uh, the longer a surface, the more porous a surface, the less like, uh, the less time it's going to be able to stay on it. So say cardboard, right, will absorb liquid, liquid dry, right, it'll, it'll uh, there's a lot of airflow in that, in that uh, surface. So the virus will not be able to stay in a uh, kind of a, a liquid, it'll air, uh, basically it'll dry out, right, on that surface. Um, those guys, probably a couple hours, right, uh, before it dries out, uh, maybe an hour, a couple hours afterwards, maybe for precaution. Uh, but more of what we worry about are kind of like the hard surfaces, so like desktops, doorknobs, you know, opening sliding doors, right? So those are usually the, the surfaces where you have more chances of being able to uh, get it on your hands. And the concern there is that if you get it on your hands and then wash your hands, you're fine, right? Like, you're totally fine. Um, but if you get it on your hands and touch your face, and that's more of the concern. So in terms of, uh, of wanting to be, uh, you know, uh, take precaution for COVID-19, um, I think more of what you would want to do is several different things. So not just decontaminating surfaces, but also washing your hands if you're out in public. So if you go in a store, when you walk out, you know, a little bit hand sanitizer just to get your hands clean before you go to start, you know, taking off your mask and start rearranging things on your face. It's mostly touching your face that we want to stop from happening. Cool. Uh, Cheryl, who uh, is asking this question from Bend, Oregon, says, uh, were younger people more susceptible to 1918 flu than COVID-2? So not so much uh, susceptibility. Susceptibility is kind of hard to gauge based off the historical record. What we know is that um, the virus was more aggressive and it became more aggressive, not just in the beginning of the pandemic, right? The first wave was a little more than what they were expecting to see, uh, but it was pretty comparable to regular seasonal flu. There's a shift though to the second wave where the virus becomes more pathogenic. Um, but in addition to being more pathogenic, and having more replica, uh, being able to replicate more quickly inside of the host cells um, in younger individuals, right? So ages, you know, 18 to, to 40, uh, this, the younger demographic, uh, you have a robust immune system. And so you are more likely to have a robust immune system. And if you have a robust immune system and a highly uh, replicated virus that's producing lots and lots and lots of virus, you have the potential for your immune system to overreact. And you're more likely to overreact when you're young and healthy and have a functioning immune system than you are if you're, say, immunocompromised or too young or on the older spectrum. And so what happened with uh, 1918 isn't so much that they were more susceptible, but more that when they got the virus, their immune system overreacted and that contributed to the pathology of the disease. So it ended up with a more severe disease in those individuals. Does that make sense, Cheryl? We're going to assume so. She's, oh, the thumbs up. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Marianne asks, could you uh, talk about the role of housing in disease rates in 1918 versus today? So housing, um, lots of what we know are 1918 has to do with actually the military housing system um, at that time. Because uh, we, the United States actually didn't join the war efforts until, you know, the later ends of, of 1917. And uh, when, we, when we do join the war effort, the first thing we do is draft. <laughs> it's an instituted draft. Uh, and not only did they draft uh, to get more soldiers uh, to send to Europe, 
uh, they also had to build barracks and you know training facilities for all of these recruits that they were going to get and this was done you know kind of on the fly like we need to get this going so that we can send out our troops early next year and when uh, so what ended up happening was is that they had a lot of young uh, people crammed into these small training sessions these these recruitment centers, centers were overcrowded uh, they had a lack of resources um, kind of already to begin with and then lo and behold in the early parts of 1918 a flu breaks out in one of those military installations so in Kansas uh, in Haskell County Kansas uh, one of the forts there they actually have a small outbreak of flu uh, in the early parts of 1918 um, and that that early uh, flu actually um, caused like 30 to 50 people at that particular camp to die. They had over 100 people infected. And essentially it all happened within the span of a week. So within the span of a week, they went from having a couple cases to you know five times that amount. And so it's just, it kind of overwhelmed them very quickly, but it was short lived and it wasn't that, you know, that much worse than seasonal flu. And so people kind of ignored it. And then troops got sent to Europe and suddenly this kicks off like a brush fire goes all over in Europe um, it dies down in this um, early summer but then come fall you have that second wave and something happened with that virus that it now is infecting uh, causing more severe disease in the younger population again it circulates within troops um, out uh, um, out in Europe those troops bring it home once the war ends and it starts up again in the United States. So essentially this was like a kind of a, a pony express, right? like just a rollover effect where everything kind of feeds into something else, right? So cramming everyone into these areas made it easier for these that disease to, to kind of spread. And once it got a foothold in the troops and they sent them overseas, it just continued on and, um, and, and took over Europe. We have two more questions and we want to make sure that we don't go too long and everybody can uh, get outside so they can enjoy some smoke. So uh, I, uh, there's a question from Carolyn. She uh, says, now seeing some difference of opinion about getting a, a flu vaccine this fall, um, as some evidence flu vaccine can make one more susceptible to other respiratory viruses. Uh, don't have any references. Is there any thoughts? Is this so, uh, I, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna. I'm gonna let uh, Anna um, say that, uh, or I'll say for her uh, that please don't take Anna's advice directly, um, and then start spreading the word that well, Doctor Girl Carmona said you should do X. Well, so so the thing with flu and cold and flu season, they are actually two different seasons. <laughs> uh, so cold season is what's coming up here in the fall, right? So this would be where you'd see those coronaviruses, uh, the, the normal coronaviruses that normally circulate, as well as uh, rhinoviruses, right, that are gonna be circulating. Um, flu season, right, for influenza, that virus, uh, that comes up in the winter. That's the season for flu, it's early um, winter. So December, January, right? Um, those are the peak flu season. When you vaccinate for a particular disorder, any, any disease, you typically want to vaccinate prior to the person coming to, you know, uh, ever getting exposed to that particular disorder. And so that means that if you're going to vaccinate for flu, you need to vaccinate during cold season. And so interesting things happen. Uh, and it's a very, very strong temporal association. Um, but essentially what happens is people get the flu vaccine. Uh, most people get this not the, the vaccine that goes into your arm. That is a, a, an inactivated virus. It's grown in chicken eggs and then uh, they're basically cooked <laughs> or spurified and then they put it uh, and they do a lot of processing and all stuff like that and then it gets into your arm in Walgreens, right? You go in and you get your shot. Uh, that is a dead virus, all right? And contrary to popular belief, dead things do not come back to life, so it stays dead, all right? You can't get a reanimation of that, of that particular virus. Now, if you're allergic to flu, all right, uh, sorry, eggs, if you're allergic to eggs, uh, you can't really take that vaccine. So there is an alternative that doesn't use eggs. Um, and that one does have the potential, 
right, uh, to cause flu. It's, it's a live attenuated virus, right? Um, it, uh, those virus vaccines, or actually live attenuated vaccines in general, always have a small chance of reversion where the, the organism reverts back to its natural form and causes disease, right? But it's a rare event, and it has to do with that uh, live attenuated vaccine, which is intranasal. Uh, but if you're getting the shot in the arm, that one's a dead virus. And what happens is that people get the vaccine during cold season, and within a week or so, get a cold. And immediately go, oh, I got the flu, or I got a mild version of the flu. And it, it isn't. Uh, if you do get the flu vaccine, you are going to have an immune response right then and there. Uh, they do tell you to watch for certain symptoms. So if you're going to have an allergic reaction, they'll monitor for certain symptoms so that in case there's a complication or anything like that. Uh, but most people handle the, the vaccine quite well, maybe a low grade fever that day, and then you, you're pretty much good to go. Right? Um, now, in terms of whether the vaccine is going to make you more susceptible to get uh, co uh, SARS-CoV-2, that I don't think we've tested. Uh, and ideally, we, we, we would want to uh, t test this, but I don't think it would, uh, like my immediate guess would be that it wouldn't uh, necessarily aggravate the disease or, or cause any particular problems, uh, that vaccine should be handled pretty well. I mean, people take that vaccine and get colds all the time. It doesn't aggravate those coronaviruses. So I don't particularly think it would in this case. Um, and I don't think we have any store. I, I don't believe there have been any um, uh, records of, of someone getting a vaccine for something else and then having a more severe reaction to uh, SARS-CoV-2. So in that respect, I don't think that would be the immediate concern, um, but I do think you uh, would highly suggest to everyone to get a flu vaccine this year if you can. If you're not allergic and if you're not uh, otherwise immune compromised and cannot get the vaccine, I think it's uh, highly suggested that all adults get uh, vaccinated for flu so that uh, essentially you, you're not potentially risking getting two very, very uh, dangerous viruses at the same time. Um, we don't know much about the co-infection rate on flu and coronavirus uh, in, in this particular setting. So we're, we're learning as we go along, but I think I do believe the CDC recommendation is to get a flu shot. Cool. Last question, Leanne and Patrick say, uh, can multiple exposures to COVID-19 uh, uh, virus in aerosol form that wouldn't by themselves cause sickness build up in the body to a level that would cause sickness? And if yes, how long can they stay, uh, th these low level exposures stay viable in the body? Mm, mm, okay. Mm. All right. So with uh, disease, uh, you, there's something of a numbers game here. All right. Uh, it's called the infectious dose. Um, so it's the amount of that particular pathogen that you need to be exposed to in order to come down with uh, disease, right? So uh, a classic example would be uh, cholera. For a long, long time, people didn't think a bacterium caused cholera. And so uh, a famous, you know, one doctor did this experiment where he took a glass of water, poured some cholera bacteria into it and took a drink and said, look, I didn't get cholera. And it turned out that he didn't have enough of the bacterium in that sample, so that when he poured it into his drink and drank it, uh, it essentially just flushed through his system. There wasn't enough bacteria to actually establish the infection and cause the disease we know as cholera. So uh, with respect to low level exposures accumulating, that's not really how it works. Right? If you get a low level exposure to anything um, and it's not enough to cause disease, uh, it's usually cleared out by your immune system and you would just never know uh, that you got exposed, that you were uh, exposed to that particular pathogen. Um, it's only when you get it in a sufficient number to be able to establish that infection, right, uh, that you would then be symptomatic. Uh, now with SARS-CoV-2, uh, there is a complication uh, that we didn't see or don't hear as much about with 1918 uh, flu pandemic, and that is uh, asymptomatic carry. So you can, uh, and there are ca uh, reported cases of people who have been exposed, are infected, but do not show symptoms. 
So they're not symptomatic, but they can still transmit virus. So they still have active replicating virus in their system. They're still shedding that virus. And therefore, when they sneeze, they're exposing everyone else to it. So other people might come symptomatic, but they themselves are not. Uh, does that help, I hope? Uh, we oh, have a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. I want to be, give a big thank you to Dr. Gro Carmona again for a lovely talk that's here for her. Thank you, thank guys. You. That was great. Thank um, you for taking the time and thank you for finding the link so you could actually give your talk. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Oh, my goodness. No, that's not. It, it sounds like several people actually that were on the call had the same problem. So I'm not sure what was up. I apologize to everyone. And I'm so glad that you all came. We hope to see you on September 22nd for the talk about gerrymandering. If not, the uh, second Tuesday in October will be our talk after that. Um, everybody stay safe. Uh, I'm glad to see you all. And congratulations, to Scott and Carolyn. You will be getting your socks in the mail. Uh, and we'll see you all soon. Take care and be well, everybody. Thank you all. Bye, guys. Stay safe. Bye.